Way back when, when I was in law school, uh, I had to take four <laughs> semester hours of federal income tax if I was going to sit for the Indiana bar exam. And it just so happened that at my law school, the federal income tax course was a three-hour course one semester and a two-hour course the second semester. And uh, I have to tell you, I, I was just swimming that first semester. And I was getting really scared. It was too late to drop the course. And in law school, at least in that law school, if you had a three-hour course, you took a three-hour final exam. And that was the only basis for your grade. And I, I was just, I was going down in flames. And then, man, it came from heaven. Actually, it didn't come from heaven. It came from my professor. You see, I, sh I, I should have counted on the fact that, that we all thought he was, well, that he really stopped working years earlier. <laughs> um, his track record was such that uh, he'd been a, a clerk to one of the justices on the United States Supreme Court, which is, I mean, it's generally pretty, pretty good. But the legend, at least at the law school, was the reason he was clerk for this particular justice was because he hailed from the same state as the uh, justice did. He came from a good southern family. He could play a respectable game of tennis. <laughs> he came in close to the end of the semester and he says, Now, I know that some of you, I can't really do his draw, but I'll try. I are going to take both semesters. So I'm going to give you an option. You can take an incomplete for this semester and then just take one final exam at the end of the second semester. Or if you wish, you can take the final exam this time and the final exam next time. And I thought, hallelujah, call that the master charge option. <laughs> Put it on my credit account. And I did that, and the good news is for me, the two, number, in the second semester it all clicked, it all started fitting together. And then it came time for the final. Now I was sharing a house with a guy, I ended up graduating number one, our class was, when, when it became a partner in a very nice, and prestigious Wall Street firm. He was a real grind, but also the best guitarist ever played in life. <laughs> Uh, but you know, he took the, the three-hour final, and he gets to the second, second semester, and his final exam is the most complex. I mean, he's got terribly difficult questions. I'm looking at mine, and it's like, see Jane run, see Jane do tax return. <laughs> it was amazing. And I ended up, I mean, I ended up with a 3.5 out of a 4.0 scale in the federal income tax for five semester hours. But I knew I, 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 that I really needed to make sure that I didn't do anybody's taxes except my own <laughs> from that point on. I mean, that's, that's why God created CPAs. Uh, but my, I, I mentioned, and, you know, and, and I, I really didn't want to down that professor. He wasn't the best professor I had. But I remember several of his sayings. Uh, that have stuck with me over the years. And, and one that I remember very distinctly, some of you have heard me say this, is that taxation is a legal <coughs> obligation, not a moral one. And he's right. The Pharisees were concerned about <coughs> Jesus' growing popularity. They rightfully regarded Jesus as a threat to the orthodoxy of their day, the established religious order, the way things had always been done and ought to be done. They, they wanted what, to expose him as a, as a charlatan or a fraud or, or paint him as a revolutionary who was a threat to the, to the Roman occupation. So one day they sent their disciples to try to trap him. 
And you know, as we read, they, they flattered him. They really buttered him up, didn't they? You're a man of integrity. You teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. You're not swayed by others because you don't pay attention to who they are. Boy, were they trying to set him up. I was high praise coming from the Pharisees, and that was bait. And of course, if there's bait, there's generally a trap. <coughs> and the trap was, so tell us, teacher, is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? Now that, I'm sure the Pharisees and the, the disciples of, of the, the Herodians uh, the, thought they had Jesus set up and there was no way out. Was he going to play to his base and encourage disobedience to Rome? Uh, that would have won him some followers, but you know, the Roman government knew how to play hardball. If on the other hand he sided with Rome, he was going to alienate the, the, everybody that despised those foreign occupiers. The Pharisees had to feel like we can't lose and he can't win. But then Jesus knew their intent. And he said, You hypocrites, why are you trying to trap me? Show me the coin. Show me the money. And when they brought him the money, he said, Now whose, whose picture is this on there? And they said, Of course, it's Caesar's. So he said, Well, let Caesar have what's Caesar's. And let God have what's God's. They were God-smacked. Or we might say they were God-smacked. And they left. Patrick Doucette told a story about a man who was vacationing in Mexico, strolling along the, the beach, uh, heard a woman screaming as she knelt in front of a small child. And the man understood enough Spanish to realize that child had, had just swallowed the coin and was choking. So seizing the child by its heels, he, he held him up and gave him a, a few shakes and suddenly in a, a, a quarter popped out of the, uh, onto the sidewalk from the child's mouth. And the woman said, oh, thank you. You seem to know just how to get it out of him. Are you a doctor? And he says, no, ma'am, I'm with the IRS. <laughs> back to Caesar is a problem. If, if a government needs your house in order to build a highway, start looking for a new one. If Congress reinstates the draft, pack your toothbrush. What Caesar wants, Caesar gets. Most of us really don't have a problem with that. We may not like paying taxes, but for the most part, we are at least content, if not happy, with the services we get from the government we've got. Comedian Jackie Mason once said, everyone should pay their income tax with a smile. He said, I tried, but they demanded cash. <laughs> when the federal income tax was signed into law in 1913, it was for 1% of the average person's income. 1%. A senator who opposed the bill said, if we allow this, this 1% foot in the door at some future date, it might rise to 5%. <laughs> if only. <laughs> so we grumble, we complain, but we still give back to Caesar. Partly out of a sense of duty, partly out of a sense of the consequences if we don't. But giving back to God, that's a different matter. Why do we give to God? Well, one reason, the first reason, is out of gratitude for all that God has done for us. We're not rich people. But most of us have been blessed in wonderful ways. And we want to say thank you to God. Tell God we love you. Pastor Adam Hamilton, pastor of a little tiny church out in Kansas, tells a story about a camping trip that he took with his family in the Grand Tetons National Park in Wyoming many years ago. And, and 
he, his birthday was coming over that trip. And when they were done setting up their campsite, he explained to his two daughters they could each have a $20 bill to spend for the three days they were going to be in that park. And, and, ex, and in excitement, the daughters dragged him to the gift shop, which was just beyond their, their campsite. One daughter, uh, his daughter Rebecca, saw a cap there, and, and she instantly picked it up, tried it on, and said, what do you think, Dad? Well, he said, you look, you look pretty in it, honey, but a hat costs $20, and that's all you've got. You're not going to have any money to spend the next two days. But Dad, all I want is this hat, and I, I really don't care if I don't have any more money to spend. And, uh, he tried to talk her out of it, but the more he tried, the more <coughs> resolute she became. Any other parents able to <laughs> give an amen on that one? So he finally gave in. He says, honey, you can buy the ball cap, but you're not getting any more money until our time here is up. He handed her the $20 bill, and she went right up and bought the hat. Before they went back to their camp, Adam took his daughters for a walk, and they sat on a bench near the lake to watch the sunset. Rebecca said, Dad, here's my birthday gift for you. And she handed him the hat. Aww. Happy birthday, Dad. I love you. And Adam Hamilton said he was sitting there on the bench, and he hugged her and started to cry. And Cap is among his most treasured possessions. The cap he wears most often, because every time he wears it, he thinks of his daughter's sacrifice for him. And that's how God looks at our acts of generosity, he wrote. When we share with God, our gifts are a way of saying, God, I am returning to you a portion of what I have to say thank you and I love you. So that's the first reason we give back to God, out of a sense of gratitude for all that God has done for us. And the second reason is because we recognize that everything we have belongs to God in the first place. The earth is the Lord's. I think we said that. And everything in it. The world and all who live in it. It's all God. It's all God. And when we when we stop, I mean, yeah, we work hard. We have to we have to we have to train our, get trained. We have to get educated. All right, work sometimes is really hard. But life and our access to all of that is a gift from God. And what did you do to deserve it? John Maxwell. Uh, tells about a congressman took his son to McDonald's one day, bought a large order of fries, coke, and one sat at a table. The sheriff to, uh, to, to snack uh, on those fries. And after after settling uh, set, settling down, the father reached out his hand to take one of the fries, and his son pulled the fries for himself, covered them up with his hand. So dad couldn't get to it. Resignation, the father said quietly, It's all yours, son. And he looked through the window and he wondered, Could it could it be that my son has forgotten who bought those fries? Does does not doesn't my son realize I don't need any of his fries? I can go get my own. What would he do if I took those fries away from him? What if I decided to buy some more fries and not give him any? Why did he fail to see? All I wanted to do was share a couple of fries with him. It was at this point that the congressman came to realize something. We're all tempted to act in the same way as his son in our relationship with God. And just like his son, we end up forgetting God's own, God owns all the blessings we thought were ours. After all, our name's on the title and on the deeds and on the account documents. 
Secondly, we selfishly deny God the portion of our blessings that rightfully belong to God. Everything, everything in the world belongs to God. We're only stewards of what is God's. And the word steward actually comes from a Greek word that referred to someone who managed the household. And in Greek culture, if a person was wealthy, had lots of money, lots of stuff, <coughs> they'd use a steward to manage their household. And the steward wasn't the owner, but they were empowered to act on the owner's behalf. Well, 20 years ago, when Bill Gates was worth only $5 billion, he hired a man named Michael Larson to manage his money. People jokingly called Larson the Gates Keeper because he had has final say over every financial matter, given full control of Bill Gates's money and investments, and his whole job is to be a good steward of the money he's entrusted with. He uses the money on behalf of Mr. Gates to benefit him and do his work. Well, these days, Bill and Melinda Gates are now worth $81 billion. At a party, he recently said that he has complete faith and trust in Larson. Money's not Larson's, but he's given control of it and given control of it for a good purpose. And of course, Bill and Melinda Gates have themselves proven they can be good stewards as they, through their, their foundation, their charitable work, serve humanity through billions of dollars of bequests. Even they realize that nothing truly belongs to them. This is does it to us. <laughs> We're just stewards of what belongs to someone else. In our case, it's belonging to God. But here's, here's the most amazing and thrilling thing about giving back to God. God takes that which we give God and multiplies it to do far more than we can even imagine. I mean, that's the, that's the message, isn't it, of the story of the little boy that had the lunch with the few fish and, you know, a little bit of bread. That ended up feeding thousands of people. It's what always happens when people offer up their gifts to the master. It's like something that happened at the at the Olympics in, in Rio de Janeiro. The, it was about a Polish and track and track and field athlete named Piotr Malachowski. Now, Malachowski says he can still remember the over flowing feeling of gratitude he experienced as he waved his silver medal on the podium. I never imagined winning a silver medal while I prepared hard for the Olympic Games he posted on his Facebook page. I did everything by the book, but gold refused to come my way. Instead of feeling angry, an overwhelming feeling of gratefulness has taken over me thanks to my silver medal. So coming in second in the men's discus throw did give him an opportunity to show his gratitude in a very special way. The mother of Oleg Zemansky, a three-year-old boy suffering from a deadly form of eye cancer, contacted Malachowski shortly after the Olympics. Oleg needed surgery to remove the cancer. But it had a price tag of $126,000, and Oleg's mother, Oleg's mother just couldn't afford that. Malachowski took interest in the little boy's case and decided to auction his precious silver medal to raise money for the surgery. And after months of fundraising efforts, however, that silver medal only drew $19,000. Nothing near what the little boy was going to need for the surgery, but then the miracle happened. Two Polish businessmen stepped forward and paid the rest. In an excitement, took to Facebook and he posted, I feel really elated. Our efforts have finally paid off and now Oleg can have his eyes treated. I really feel fulfilled. And he ought to feel fulfilled. What greater joy can a person experience than being responsible for saving the life of a child or another person? What better use could you put your money to? Remember what Jesus said, truly I tell you, whatever you did for the least of these, my sisters and brothers, you did for me. 
whenever we give back to God through the church, you're showing your love for God. So why do we give back to God? Out of gratitude for everything God's done for us. Because we love God. We give because everything already belongs to Him and we're just the stewards. It's not going to be a U-Haul behind the hearse when the day comes. We do it because we know that God will take what we give and will bless it and cause it to go a lot further than we can even imagine. Give unto Caesar? Yeah. It's not as if we have much of a choice. Give unto God? That's a wonderful privilege. I invite you to stand and let's sing together. Thank you.